Psalmist says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth, stir up your might, and come down to save us. Well, we begin by singing this morning another psalm about God, our great shepherd, number 23a. The Lord my shepherd rules my life and gives me all I need. Number 23A. As we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, our great shepherd, the ruler of our lives, we bow in your presence and we gladly acknowledge your sovereign authority, your rule over us, your people. Great and gracious 
and gentle as that rule is, and yet full of power and authority and, and righteousness and strength. How glad we are, O oh God, that we are yours, that we are people of the Good Shepherd who loved the sheep and laid down his life for them. How we rejoice that it is indeed your goodness, your gracious love that we've sung about that pursues us, pursues us relentlessly all our days because you are faithful to us, oh, so faithful despite all our waywardness, all our unfaithfulness. And because you love us, you will not let us go, but neither will you let us off, because as a father you discipline us, you bring your word to our lives to hone us, to straighten us, to challenge us, to correct us. Oh, because you love us. So, Lord, as we gather here this day as your people, we pray, would you draw near to us again? Yes. Open our ears and open our hearts also to your truth. Will you search us in the innermost parts so that you will bring to light those things that displease you those things in our lives that disappoint you. And Lord, will you grant us forgiveness, we pray, for all of these things, for each one of us this morning comes with many, many needs of repentance. And will you restore us? And will you renew us afresh by your Holy Spirit? Do this, O oh God, we pray this day, so that we may indeed bring glory to your name as you would have us do, and as we ourselves long to do. Lead us, Lord, we pray, that we also may lead others, that we may be a people who do Jesus' work in Jesus' way, and so that we, in living our lives for him, might bring glory to his name and his name alone, even as we walk that road to glory everlasting with him. So hear us, Lord, in this our morning prayer. Grant us the sweetness and the blessing of your presence, we ask, because we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to all of you this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. We're always glad to welcome visitors in the name of the Lord Jesus and uh, of his fellowship here in this church. We hope we'll have a chance to meet you and greet you after the service, and uh, we hope that you feel very much at home here with us. One or two things to mention on these sheets that I think you uh, have received on the way in. Uh, you'll see there are a number of notices there, things going on this coming week in the middle panel. Do remember our prayer meeting particularly on Wednesday evening when we meet and gather as a church to pray. We've been seeing in Peter's first letter that uh, a true gospel church makes a priority of prayer that so much flows from that. So do come and join us as we do that glad work together on Wednesday. And do be praying for these other events going on even if you're not uh, involved in them directly. On the right hand side notice the summer camps. We saw that little video last week about uh, uh, one of those, LM6A, but there's details there about that, and also the contagious uh, Bible teaching camp, so do uh, take notice of those. And do be praying also for this Saturday and for uh, one of the first events for the new West of Scotland Gospel Partnership, where uh, we hope most of our young folks, along with those from many other churches around Glasgow and the West, uh, will be meeting together for this time, so please do be praying for them. I'd also value prayer for next Saturday. I'll be in London for the uh, international board meeting of the Delhi Bible Institute. It's always an exciting meeting. And then I'm delighted that uh, coming back up with me will be Isaac Shaw, who is the director of DBI, and we're going to have Isaac preaching for us next Sunday morning. So it'll be great to uh, see him again, to hear from him, and uh, I think one or two other groups in the church are going to hear from him as well over the next couple of days. So do be praying for that and for him uh, as he travels. Then finally, two other things that I know you've been praying for. The first is 
uh, our brother Andy Baxter, who was having a complicated neurosurgery on Wednesday. Uh, Andy is uh, home and doing well, and uh, he and Naomi are very grateful for your prayers. Please do continue to pray for them, that he will have uh, a continuing good recovery. But we give thanks to God that he's come through that operation with no ill effects and uh, with, it seems, uh, a positive outcome thus far. So do give thanks uh, for answered prayer. And then I know many of you were praying for me yesterday as I was uh, in Dundee with uh, the leaders of Grace Church in Dundee as they were interviewing uh, in the final stages of their selection procedure for a a new pastor. Uh, And I know that you will rejoice, as I hope the congregation there will rejoice, as they're being told this morning that uh, that group has chosen a sole nominee for them to preach for them next week uh, for the church. And uh, he'll be known to many of you here because his name is Mark Ellis. And some of you will remember him uh, as he grew up as a young man here in the Tron congregation. So uh, please do pray for Mark and pray for the church and the leadership there at Grace Church in Dundee. And uh, let us join our prayers with theirs, uh, that we trust this will be the beginning of a new and very fruitful uh, ministry there in that city. Well, I'll leave you to read the rest of these uh, notices at your leisure. Uh, Please do that and uh, take note of them. We're going to turn now to our Bible reading this morning. We're back in 1 Peter, uh, chapter 5, in our uh, church Bibles. That's page 1016. And we're looking this morning, really, at just the first four verses of 1 Peter chapter 5. But I'm going to read in from verse 12 of chapter 4, which we studied last week, because that sets the context and the immediate connection uh, to what Peter is saying here. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, even of God, rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or even as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is with difficulty saved, through a hard road, he means, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So I exhort elders, or older men, you could translate that, among you, as a fellow elder and as a fellow witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble." Amen. May God bless to us this, his word. We're going to sing now the hymn on the screens, a hymn by Charles Wesley, which speaks of the charge that every Christian has, whether a leader or whether serving God in any capacity in the church. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky.
Well, as the musicians play our offerings for the Lord's work, we'll be received. You might want to read again these words. We'll be studying shortly, or perhaps just be quietly praying uh, for those that you know to be in need uh, at this time. But as we do that in the quiet, our offerings will be received. pray. Heavenly Father, as we bring these gifts before you, joining them with all the giving of our fellowship in these and many other ways, we do pray, O God, that in giving these gifts, you would take and use them, that the name of Christ may be glorified in this world, that his gospel may be proclaimed and heard and understood, and rejoiced in, and obeyed. How our world needs this transforming gospel of grace. And we long, O God, for our friends, our neighbors, our families, our fellow countrymen, to know what we know, and to rejoice in what we rejoice in, the joy of serving the great shepherd of the sheep, a God who is not distant, but has drawn near and made himself known, and even shed his own blood for those that he made and who turned away so dreadfully. And yet he has brought back and made his own all over again. Lord, this is the joy of the gospel that wells up in our hearts, and we long for others to know and to share what we share. We think, Lord, of people all around the world this morning, meeting as we are doing in the name of Jesus. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that wherever there are such gatherings, that your Holy Spirit would be bringing power and strength and courage and confidence in your word of grace, that even in the face of hostility, even in the face of frank persecution, There may be a power and a grace upon your church as she makes Jesus Christ known. 
we can't help but think, O oh Lord, of all those hundreds of grieving and worrying uh, family members of the passengers on this plane which has so mysteriously disappeared, which is being tracked all over East Asia by governments in many countries. We have no idea, O oh God, what has happened, but our hearts go out to those grieving ones, surely grieving the loss of loved ones, but the uncertainty bringing a nagging doubt and a flickering hope which perhaps makes that pain even more unbearable. We think, Lord, of Christian people who may be involved in some way or other with members of the families there who are grieving either in China or Malaysia or the other countries that are involved. We pray, Lord, for those who bear the name of Christ in such a situation and ask that they would be able to bring the tender love, the comfort, and even the hope that is in Jesus alone. Lord, thinking back to our own country here, we do rejoice with our brothers and sisters in the fellowship at Grace Church Dundee that this morning as they share this glad news together and next week as they meet to hear Mark Ellis preaching for that charge, we pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon them for good, that you would encourage them greatly today at this news and that all being well, we trust this new beginning for that leadership there in that congregation would be one of great moment and potential. And that potential would be realized in the months and the years to come that the gospel witness there in that city, along with others, might grow and develop and flourish and expand, that many might hear of the Savior through the work of that church, and that others may be trained and themselves nurtured and groomed and sent out into ministry and mission in this land and beyond. How we thank you, Father, for the bonds of fellowship and of friendship that we have with churches such as these. We ask that you would help us, one with another, to mutually encourage and bless and strengthen as together throughout this land and along with many others also, we seek to partner, share fellowship, share communion in the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we think this morning of your great and abundant goodness to us here as a fellowship and to individuals within us as people. We do thank you, Lord, very especially this morning for answered prayer for our brother Andy Baxter. We thank you for guiding the surgeons, for bringing Andy through that operation and we pray, Lord, that you would even now be strengthening his body and swiftly restoring him to full health and strength, that he might soon be back in his work among the students here in the city of Glasgow, sharing your gospel with them, nurturing, training, mentoring, and encouraging them. We pray for Naomi. We ask that you would help her to tend him and care for him and love him, that together, Lord, they might weather this storm and bring glory to your name. And Lord, we know that in a congregation of our size this morning, there will be many of us here who have come with hearts full of sadness, full of perhaps bitter pain, at a recent diagnosis in a loved one, perhaps still raw from the loss and the bereavement of a dear loved one, a family member, a marriage partner, a friend. Dear Lord, how glad we are that we come to you, the great shepherd, who leads us even through the valley of the shadow of death so that we might fear no evil. We pray, Lord, that to all such this morning whose hearts are burdened, whose hearts are heavy and sad, that you would bring the light and the warmth of your comforting grace, that as the rays of the sun bathe this earth, so the rays of your covenant love and faithfulness would envelop your people and draw them into the light of a Savior's love. So, Heavenly Father, as together we gather around your word this morning, we ask that you would come. Come, for we invite you. 
Come and transform our pleasures. Guide us into paths unknown. Bring your gifts. Command your servants so that indeed we may trust in you alone. And though your hand may work in secret, we shall see what you have done and what you are still doing in our lives and in this world. So hear us, Lord, and come to us and meet us in your word, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. We sing then hymn number 572, Jesus, come, for we invite you, guest and master, friend and Lord. Number 572. Let's turn, shall we, to 1 Peter chapter 5, and the first four verses, which are all about the road to glory for every true Christian leader. We've seen, Peter tells us, that we are an Easter people, <clears throat> that is, that we are called to be shaped through suffering with Jesus. And we saw last time that that's true for every true believer in Christ, chapter 4, verse 13, we share Christ's suffering so that we may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. And indeed, Peter emphasizes that that is also true in every single Christian church the world over. Look at chapter 5, verse 9. The same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Every believer, every church, and in verses 1 to 4 of chapter 5, he makes another very important point that Christian leaders, and especially those in uh, 
positions of prominence in local churches, that they are not somehow exempt from this. In fact, exactly the reverse, says Peter. Like uh, Peter himself, who was an apostle, and indeed at least for a time was the lead apostle among Christian leaders. All Christian leaders, if they are indeed true leaders, will experience, will witness, says Peter, the sufferings of Christ, just as he had done. Far from being exempt from such sufferings, leaders will lead the way in suffering as examples to the flock. And so the message of these verses is very clear. The road to glory for every true Christian leader is likewise to be a road shaped through suffering for glory. But for them, that will happen as they are shaped through their own shepherding of the flock. The particular sphere of their sufferings will very often be the very ministry that they are called to among God's people. So this is a very important message, isn't it, for Christian pastors, perhaps especially for those in training as pastors, for those who may aspire to this place in Christian service. But of course, Peter's reference is quite wide. In fact, Uh, His focus is much more on the tasks and on the responsibilities common to all Christian leadership within the church than it is about talking particularly about some special office in the church. He's not talking here, as Paul does in the pastorals, about how leaders are to be appointed, but he's talking about what leaders are to do and how they're to do it. And that means, of course, then, that what he says is really very widely applicable to all who in any way bear responsibility in the church who bear responsibility for the care of others, for the nurture of others uh, in the faith. But of course, uh, senior leaders are uh, particularly under scrutiny here. I'm very conscious of that. I'm very conscious I myself. I'm preaching to myself this morning as much as to any of you. But then so is everybody under scrutiny. Look at verse 5. Don't miss that. We'll look at it next week. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, the seniors, those in positions of authority. So there's an important word here, isn't there, for absolutely everybody, those in leadership, those being prepared for leadership, and indeed the whole church, who need to understand what genuine Christian leadership looks like, and to ensure that their church does in fact exhibit it. And when it has that, to encourage it, to cherish it, and not to undermine it. So let's focus this morning then just on these four verses and see what Peter tells us about the charge and the character and the crown of true Christian leadership. But first of all, you'll see his focus is on another C. I think we should probably call it the middle C, the center point of all true Christ-like leadership, the cost. Look at verse 1, where he says, the cost of true leadership is that leaders will be witnesses to the sufferings of Christ. Verse 1 begins with the word so, because what Peter says here follows directly on from what he said in the preceding verses about the times of frequent trial that will test the church in a hostile culture, in a culture that will throw insults and reviling at people for the name of Christ. And in times of stress like that, it is crucial that the whole church will relate rightly to one another, that there will be godly leadership and godly respect among members. That is essential if the church is to weather these sorts of storms. So, Peter says, leaders must step up and lead by example. Well, we've seen that, haven't we? Many of us in recent times, uh, how absolutely necessary that is. We've seen right here in Scotland that where there's been absent leadership or where leadership in a church has been undermined in some congregations. Uh, The whole church has been left at sea. It's been left rudderless. It's been left drifting dangerously in dangerous times. We've seen that, haven't we? So, says Peter, verse 1, there's a responsibility on all, on leaders and on all the rest, verse 5, on the younger. But the leaders are addressed first. Now, it may be uh, coincidence or it may be deliberate, I don't know, but in Chapter 4, verse 17, you see that we looked at last time where Peter speaks about judgment beginning at the house of God. 
His words there reflect almost exactly the words in Ezekiel chapter 9. Don't look it up, but it's where God speaks about judgment beginning at the house of God, and that judgment begins with the elders. And Peter here first addresses elders, presbyters. Literally, the word just means older men. It's the same word used in verse 5 in contrast to younger men. But it's clear here he's, he's talking about those who have leadership responsibilities. Now, that was a cultural norm going back to ancient times. You read way back in the Old Testament, in Exodus 24, for example, of the elders of ancient Israel. You read in the Gospels about the Jewish leaders, the, the elders and the scribes. So it was quite natural that that term was carried over into the Christian community and the church. The church is, of course, the renewed Israel of God. And so we read in Acts 15 of the apostles and the elders in the church in Jerusalem. You read of Paul, wherever they went in their missionary journeys, appointing uh, elders, presbyters, Acts 14, verse 23, for example. And you read that uh, Paul sent Titus to Crete to appoint these presbyters in every town. Now, in these early days, most of these men were probably senior men who were heads of their own households, some of the very large households with lots of servants. And therefore, they were naturally uh, able and fitted uh, for leadership in the house churches, which probably met in their homes. In fact, that's why in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're told the leader must be able to manage his own household and do that properly. Otherwise, how on earth can he manage the household of God, God's church? So he means here senior men. But of course, it's clear in the New Testament that age alone is not a sufficient qualification. That's why in the pastoral epistles, Paul lays out all sorts of other things that are important. And of course, the chief of these, of course, is the ability to be able to teach faithfully the true gospel. And that, of course, is because Christ's church is led not by man's word, however senior he may be, however wise he may be, but by the word of God alone. Peter's clear about that here in chapter 4, verse 11. Do you remember? It's God's oracles, not man's wise words, that serves the church. So leadership in God's church always comes through ministry of the Word of God, and that alone. That's why Hebrews 13, verse 7 says, leaders are those who spoke the Word of God to you. But of course, to do that rightly, and in a way that will lead the church truly, requires maturity. John Calvin says that Peter calls them elders here, not necessarily because they're all old in age, but because, he says, they were mainly chosen from the older. For, says Calvin, age, for the most part, has more prudence, authority, and experience. Now, I know that is not very popular today in our particular culture. It may not be very impressive to many of the younger people here, but friends, in fact, that is true. When I was 17, I thought I knew everything. When I was 27, I thought I knew a lot more than I now realize I do not know at the age of 47. Maybe if I live to 67, I'll have learned something. Prudence, authority, and experience comes with maturity. Now, cultures differ, of course, on what number of years will confer this uh, status of age upon someone. In the ancient world, generally speaking, it was roughly about the age of 40. But Peter's point isn't about specific age. It's about speaking of men with prudence, authority, and experience. That is, with enough of life's experience and testing as fit people to be mature Christian people of some stature and some stability. It's notable if you read 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1 that most of the qualifications, indeed all of the qualifications, apart from the ability to teach, which is essential, all of the qualifications for leadership in that way concern character and behavior, which is tested by experience. And again, I can tell you from personal experience how disastrous it is when a church lacks age and experience in their leadership. Pity the church that is led only by young and inexperienced men. There is a reason, is there not, why car insurance is so astronomically expensive for young men. There is a reason for that. 
And churches could learn a useful lesson from Sun Alliance or Direct Line. They're not fools. And neither should we be in the church. Notice verse 1, Peter calls himself a fellow elder. Not only uh, is he showing an example there of not lording it over other leaders in view of his apostleship, but he's showing us that the apostolic authority and the rule in the church became merged with that of the presbyter. Remember back in John chapter 21, three times Jesus commanded Peter, feed my sheep, shepherd, pastor, my flock. Exactly the same language as he uses here in verse 2. Our word pastor, by the way, is just a Latin version of the Greek word here, shepherd. Now, of course, at this stage, of course, there was no uh, fixed structures or patterns of church offices as such. Indeed, if you read the New Testament honestly, you'll find that there's a fair degree of variation. There are different emphases that are there in the church, and that's, of course, why over the years, different churches, different groupings have developed uh, different leadership structures. That's because the New Testament does not simply lay down absolutely clearly one particular church polity. And that's true, no matter how deeply held some forms of church polity are to some people. There's a variety. But Peter's point is a simple one. He is simply saying there must be leadership and good leadership. And his focus is on what that entails and how it's carried out, on the charge and the character of that leadership. But the first focus is on the cost. Peter calls himself a fellow witness of Christ's sufferings. The word fellow there really governs both the word elder and witness. And he's saying right up front that true Christian leadership is costly because it is Christ-like. Leaders are not exempt from the stresses and strains of verses 12 to 19 of chapter 4 with all the fiery trials. Indeed, he is saying they will exemplify them. And often they will be in the front line facing the fire the hardest. Now, Peter himself knew that. Read Acts 5, read Acts 12. He was put in prison because the authorities wanted to disrupt the church. He was targeted, and others very similarly. Paul tells us the same of uh, Epaphroditus and of Timothy and Philippians, suffering for the gospel. Paul himself knew all about it. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And that's still so today. If you read the magazines of Release International or the Barnabas Fund, you'll see it is the leaders who are very often imprisoned and martyred first because they know that if you want to hit the church, hit the leadership. And in many situations of stress and conflict, whether from without or from within the church, the truth is that the chief burdens of such do inevitably fall upon church leaders, and sometimes that cost is very great. I've seen good men, dear, dear brothers in Christ, people I esteem and love, nearly crushed by the personal cost of their faithfulness in leadership. Witnesses, says Peter, of the sufferings of Christ in very painful things, in very disturbing things. As one writer says, the courageous act of leading the church in perilous times rather than renouncing Christ is itself a form of witness Peter shares with local church leadership. They too will suffer as he did because there's a cost to real Christian leadership. Because as Peter says, we share already as partakers in the glory of Christ that one day it will be revealed, one day will be shown to the whole world. But for now, do you remember last time? That glory rests upon us, look at chapter 4, verse 14, as we are insulted, as we are reviled for his name's sake. We're partaking in that. So Christian leadership is a noble calling. Paul says that to Timothy. But there is cost, and leaders will not be exempt from that suffering. They will exemplify it often in an exaggerated way. So you need to be clear about that, young men, if you desire to lead. Not only, as James tells us, will those who teach be judged more strictly, they will be witnesses painfully 
and truly of the sufferings of Christ. That is the cost of Christian leadership. As I said, he's, he's not talking here exclusively about one particular pastoral office alone. Alan Stibbs in his commentary, I think, is right when he says that there's a wide reference here to any within local congregations who exercise pastoral care and oversight over others. Some leaders, of course, have oversight over a whole congregation. That's my charge. That's the, the calling that I was inducted to here in this congregation. But many others have people in their charge. That's the phrase used in verse 3. Many of, many of us here have that also, people in our charge, in a host of different ministries, small group ministries, release the word, Tron it to, area groups, youth team ministries, and, and on and on it goes. Every husband and father, according to the New Testament, is a leader in his own home, bears that responsibilities. Well, there's a cost to that, always, if it's to be true Christian leadership. And, of course, don't forget, says Peter, a glory, a glory which will one day be revealed. But what is this charge then, whether we find ourselves in charge of large numbers of people or small? Well, the first part of verse 2 gives us clearly the charge of all true Christian leadership, and that is that true leaders will lead, not follow the flock of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is not a democracy. I'll say that again. The church of Jesus Christ is not a democracy. That may be a surprise to some people. It may be very uncongenial to some people in our modern day. But Peter is clear. The charge of the presbyter is to lead, to shepherd the flock, pastor it, as Ephesians 4 verse 11 translates that word a little more familiar for us. To shepherd the flock and to exercise oversight. The word is episcopate. It's where we get our word bishop from. The shepherd is to oversee with authority. But nevertheless, verse 4, under the authority of the chief shepherd, the arch shepherd, literally, who is Jesus Christ and no other, let it be noted. So what he's saying is every Christian leader in charge of others is, in one sense, a bishop. But the only archbishop that there is is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he is in heaven, by the way, not in Canterbury and not in Rome, certainly. Only one archbishop. Now, Peter's already told us back in chapter 2, verse 25, that Jesus is the pastor bishop. He is the shepherd, the pastor. He is the overseer of our souls. And so the clear charge of all Christian leadership is to share in that ministry of Jesus, to do Jesus' work, Jesus' way. But that means, according to Peter, that every Christian leader will be a real shepherd. So we need to know what he means by that word, shepherd. There is nothing sentimental about the Bible's use of that term, shepherd. It is not ever a picture of uh, meekly playing with cuddly lambs and all that sort of thing. Not at all. We read Psalm 80 at the beginning of the service about God, the shepherd of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, the mighty leader who comes down to save his people. Psalm 78 speaks likewise of God leading his people like a flock out of Egypt through the wilderness, but driving out enemies like a fierce warrior on their behalf. In Isaiah chapter 40, yes, indeed, it does speak of God leading his people gently and carrying lambs, but in the same breath, he speaks about God's might and his ruling arm around his people. Even in Psalm 23, as we sang, it's all about God's strength to lead and provide and protect from evil, and drive away foes, and with his rod and staff to discipline his people. And so we could go on. But God the shepherd is God the strong and powerful leader and protector of his people. And so it was natural that God designated national leaders of Israel to be called their shepherds, the kings and the prophets and so on. Because if you read the Old Testament, you discover that so often they fail to be good and true leaders like that. Read Jeremiah 23, read Ezekiel 34. And so God had to promise that he himself 
would come down and be the shepherd of his people. He himself would raise up another David, the great shepherd king, who would come and rescue his people and lead them and rule them truly forever. So, of course, Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd. And Hebrews 13 calls him the great shepherd, and Peter here, the chief shepherd. And Jesus himself passes on that role of shepherd, not anymore to the leaders of Israel as a nation, but to the leaders of the church. First to his apostles, and then to those whom the apostles would choose and appoint and train. And that is the true apostolic succession. It's in the task of true and godly shepherding. It's in the charge. It's not in some charm that comes through the laying on of hands, in some idea of unbroken physical succession from the first apostles in Jerusalem. That idea of the Church of Rome was quite rightly refuted and dispensed with by the Reformers. It is quite erroneous. We should have nothing to do with it. But the charge of caring for God's people must be passed on. Paul says that so clearly in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, you are to find others and entrust to faithful men who are able to teach others also this task that you have. And that is what Peter is saying here. Jesus commanded him to feed the sheep, to shepherd, to pastor his flock. And now he is passing that on to others. And true shepherding means that. It means pastoring, pasturing with spiritual food, with the truth of the gospel of Christ. It's the very words that Paul used in Acts chapter 20, where they gathered the Ephesian elders and told them they were to be bishops, they were to be overseers of the flock. How? By teaching them the whole counsel of God, as he had done. By protecting them from the wolves who would come in and pervert the truth. And by admonishing them. That is, by applying the disciplines of God's Word to them, even painfully, with tears. The shepherd is to oversee by proclaiming the Word and by protecting the work of God. As Dick Lucas has put it, uh, an elder presbyter must be a teacher of the truth. Any other rule will become ungodly and worldly. Because again, chapter 4, verse 11, it is speaking God's words, His oracles, not man's, that serves the church. That's why in Ephesians 4, verse 11, that word pastor, shepherd, and teacher are joined together almost as one word, pastors and teachers. Because it is by speaking God's words that we lead and no other way. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that all Christian leaders must be able to teach and preach publicly in front of a, a whole congregation. Well, obviously, anybody who is called to the charge of a congregation must be able to preach and teach with authority like that because that is how the church is led. It's quite wrong for someone to be a preacher to say, well, I'm not a leader. I just do the teaching. That's a contradiction in terms. Because leadership in the Bible is through the gospel, through God's Word. And you will be doing it, either well or badly. But all leadership must be able to teach and apply the Word of God with authority and therefore exercise oversight over those who are, verse 3, in their charge. Whether that's in a small group or a large group, whether it's with individuals, whether it's just one-to-one. -one. Because we lead by the Word of God alone. And because we are all, every one of us, under shepherds of Christ, the chief shepherd, the great shepherd. To lead is to shepherd, to pastor people, to oversee the people of God in our charge, those who are our responsibility, and to be to them servants, ministers of the Word of God. Never masters of the Word, but servants of it. And that is Christian leadership, whether your charge is large, responsible for many people, or whether it's small, over a few, over a, a home group, a CU group, a Bible study, your own children at home, if you're a mother. There's nothing wrong, of course, with relative seniority. Of course, the New Testament recognizes that. It regularly addresses some as more senior leaders and others as more junior. 
Most church structures today, of course, do just the same. In fact, even Presbyterian churches use that term bishop sometimes, of a senior minister overseeing a more junior one or ones that are in training. But however senior or junior, all who bear responsibility over others must lead. Not following the sheep, not pandering to the sheep, and sheep can sometimes be very stubborn, can't they? Sometimes very stupid. But exercising godly oversight, teaching and admonishing, calling to account, grasping nettles you would rather not grasp, and applying God's Word in the sphere of your responsibility among those who are in your charge. And it's when Christian leaders, in whatever context, don't do that, that we see the tragedy of sheep without a shepherd, a leadership vacuum that just leads to disaster. True shepherds must be real leaders, says Peter. But equally, he says, true shepherds must be true servants. Look at verse 4 again. Every leader, every leader, no matter how senior, is serving the chief shepherd. Even the most senior leader will never, ever, ever be the arch-shepherd because only Jesus is the ruler of his church. So every leader, however senior, must speak God's word, not his own. He serves with God's strength, not his own. It's Jesus' work, Jesus' way. And that leads Peter, in verses 2 and 3, to the character of true Christian leadership. True leaders, he says, will serve in the pattern of Christ himself, not in that of the world. And he gives three antitheses here that characterize true Christian leadership. And of course, it's specially applied to leaders, but again, as he says, verse 3, even the most senior leaders are to be examples to the flock. They are to show the way of godly service to all. They're to show other leaders how to lead. They're to show junior leaders how to become senior leaders properly. And they're to help others to be led because they will gladly follow such godly leadership and not resent it. And speaking of these things, you see, he is recognizing that the shepherd is a leader and that he must lead strongly. That's why he addresses here the particular perils of somebody who will lead clearly and strongly. John Calvin says it sums up three common vices for any pastor. Sloth, desire for gain, and lust for power. So first he says in verse 2, exercise oversight not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. In other words, he's saying a leader must not be shrinking or shirking, but stepping up willingly like Christ himself, the chief shepherd. I don't think here it is so much sloth, actually, or shirking that he's concerned with. Although there is no room for laziness in Christian ministry, it's hard graft. There's no place in Christian leadership for the work shy. And if you're thinking of Christian leadership yourself, you need to be ready for that. You need to work doing not just what you're compelled to do, but working hard with self-motivation to do all that you can do for Christ. Of course, it's not only Christian ministry that's hard work. Let's not be silly about this. Most work is hard work, isn't it? One of the problems of people coming into Christian ministry who have never done any other work, when they find the work hard, they just think it's ministry that's hard work. Well, it's not. It's life that's hard. That's why it's such a good thing, usually, for most people coming into ministry to experience other work. They learn all these things that everybody else has to put up. It's not just them. We need to get real about life, not just ministry. But I don't think Peter's focus here is so much on shirking in that sense. Rather, I think he's speaking about shrinking, shrinking back in the face of difficulty, in the face of danger and persecution. What he's saying is leaders are called to lead under fire. They're called to put their head above the parapet, to face opposition with courage, not with cowardice. But that will mean being shot at. Being shot at is not nice. It's not easy. It's not pleasant. Someone once said to me that those called to be pioneering leaders get shot at twice, from the front and from the back. And I think that pretty, is, pretty much is true to life. And Peter knew that. 
Acts chapter 12, James was martyred. Peter was imprisoned. And in his prison, there wasn't Sky TV and permanent football like there is today. And that's hard, isn't it? It's hard in the midst of struggle and conflict because the easiest thing in the world is to put your head down to avoid that conflict. Keep your head down about theological controversy. Avoid opprobrium with the establishment. Yes, be evangelical, but water down the implications of the gospel just enough, and you will avoid suffering. You will. And very probably you'll gain recognition as well. They'll make you a bishop and give you a seat in the House of Lords. They'll make you a moderator and put a big chain around your neck. The chain isn't still lost. Or in a congregation, it's very tempting to give people what they want and decline to grasp nettles. And that way you will remain popular. That way you will burnish your reputation with many as a wonderful preacher. While the church, of course, just becomes entrenched in sinful behavior and is never changed truly by the gospel. But you will not suffer. Let me tell you, anyone who has had to face hostile fire from without or faced harmful sin within a church knows how hard that is, how wounding that is, how scarring, how painfully crushing that can be to be personally crucified by character assassination, by, by gossip, by lies, and all sorts of things. But the road to glory, says Peter, for the Christian leader means not shrinking from that, but stepping up willingly as God would have you in the pattern of the Christ himself. He was not like the hired hand who protect himself at the expense of the sheep, but who laid down his own life for the sheep at great cost. Not shrinking, but stepping up. And verse 2, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, that is, not seeking but sharing worthily like Christ the Good Shepherd. It's clear, isn't it, in the New Testament that those who were given over wholly to shepherding the flock of God did receive financial compensation so that they didn't have to work alongside in order to support themselves. But of course, as soon as you have that, you lay open the door for abuse. And Paul speaks in 1 Timothy 6 of the snare that is desire for gain and the evil that it leads to. That's why one of the qualifications for leadership in the pastorals is not being a lover of money. It's always such a concerning sign when I hear a young minister or someone in training, or indeed an older one, who's never off the subject of money, how they might get this grant or that extra allowance or whatever it might be, my heart sinks because I know where that's going to end up. I've seen it. I've seen ministries ruined by pastors who have self-gain or by pastors' wives who are not happy with their lot and want more. Of course, there's another side. Jesus is plain, isn't he? The laborer deserves his food. Jesus is clear and Paul is clear. The church has a responsibility not to have its workers in penury. The servants of the church can't serve if they're worried sick all the time about how they're going to pay the next bill. But it's an attitude here that Peter's speaking of. One of not seeing leadership as about gain, but about giving. Not about seeking, but about sharing lives and sharing substance for Christ and his people. And yet we're all human, aren't we? And there are many, many temptations. Think of a pastor in a very poor country where he is the one with access to the church's funds. What a great temptation that is for him to help himself or to help his cronies or to give way to the many hangers-on and people who will chase him asking for money. Very, very hard. Or even here, where some pastors are struggling financially. How easy to suck up to those who do have money and get in with them for what they can give you and become beholden to them and ultimately their puppet. Oh, that happens so often. I know of an instance where it ended up exactly with that, with a pastor being hamstrung and unable to deal with problems in his leadership because he was so beholden to them in a financial sense. Or what about the situation of real hostility in some parts of the world today where the state is persecuting the church and there is great pressure to take bribes in order to cooperate with the church? 
I read just this week in the latest release international magazine of a pastor in Vietnam who said exactly that, that the government is giving incentives to church leaders for their cooperation, financial incentives. And I quote him, unfortunately, this strategy is beginning to work. It's bringing division among church leaders. They no longer trust one another. I've been offered, he says, I've been told that the government will open doors for me, but I would have to close the doors of the Bible college that I run. And so he says, the only way for Christianity to survive in Vietnam is for every church leader to carry his cross. No self-seeking, but sharing like the Lord Jesus himself. And thirdly, in verse 3, not scourging, but serving winsomely like Christ himself. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Surely Jesus' words in Mark 10 are ringing in Peter's ears. The rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, but not so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, neither Peter nor Jesus is criticizing strong leadership, not at all. He is urging real, clear, strong leading. He tells us leaders are in charge in the sense that they're responsible for the ones who are in their charge, as verse 3 says. But those who are in their charge, verse 2 tells us, are the flock of God. They're his sheep. They're to be pastored his way, the way of the good shepherd. As one writer has put it, followers of Jesus are to use their authority to serve. Peter knew that so easily with strength can go pride. As John Calvin says, when the pastor exempts himself from all subjection and oppresses the church with tyranny. And yes, that can happen. But not so with you, says Jesus. To all who lead in his church, whatever capacity, great or small. Calvin reminds us that God never cedes to his leaders in the church, government of the church, only the care of the church. The entire dominion, he says, belongs to God alone. And so senior leaders are never to forget this, but rather to exemplify, says Peter, Christ-like service. Not weakness, not puny pliability, no, but the real strength of the meekness of Christ himself, whose authority was absolutely beyond doubt. There to be examples to the more junior leaders that real authority comes both in the message, which is God's word and not ours, but also in the manner of the messenger, from lips and from lives that proclaim God's grace and his truth. We exhibit Christ's true authority when we serve his word and when we serve his people. Real leaders use their authority to serve. Whatever the sphere, whatever the particular charge, large or small. But all leaders do have a charge to keep. And we all need to recognize that, whether we're leaders or followers. Verse 5, we'll look at next time, but it's plain, isn't it? Just as leaders are to be held accountable for their actions, so are we all. You who are younger, be subject. That's Peter's favorite phrase, isn't it? So those of you in Release the Word, when you go home, read Hebrews 13, verse 17. Your leaders watch over you and your souls as those who will give an account. So help them. Don't hinder them. Let them do it with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no benefit to you. You young folk who are in Activate and Tron Youth and Bible class, read 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12 later on. Respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Sometimes I have to tell you off. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. And of course, these and many other sins apply to all of us, don't they? It's all for our good and for our health. Because where a church is rightly ordered with real Christian leadership in evidence, not absent, it will be clear, as Howard Marshall puts it, that leadership does not mean superiority and the right to domineer. 
And fellowship does not mean the right to undermine. That's very well put, isn't it? Leaders, says Peter, must be real shepherds, strong, fearless overseers of the flock. But leaders must also be real servants, humble under-shepherds for the flock. And that's the only road that will lead to what Peter holds out here in verse 4, the crown of true leadership, whereby the true Christian leader will share in the glory of Christ. The real key to all Christian leadership and all Christian service of any kind is to remember that there is a chief shepherd and that we serve him alone and that he alone has dominion over his church. But because the chief shepherd is also the great shepherd and the good shepherd who loves his sheep, he will appear, says Peter, and he will share his glory with all his faithful ones, an unfading crown of glory, not like the crown of any earthly glory of this world. That'll fade just as the grass and the flower of the grass he spoke of in chapter 1. The crown that comes to the faithful steward in Jesus' parable, not the wicked servant who abused the household for his own benefit. could be that the crown of unfading glory here is just the entrance to heaven. It's just the crown of life. Uh, that Paul speaks of and Revelation speaks of. But it may be there's more than that here, because remember Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, in the context of Christian ministry, he speaks, doesn't he, about building in our ministry on gold and silver and precious stones, things that will outlast the fire of judgment. And what survives, he says, will bring reward. And presumably that is the unfading joy of seeing the real fruit of your labors for Christ at last because we don't see that at present, do we? Peter says that the glories that we are partakers of already won't be revealed fully until the Lord appears. And we'll share often in the meantime in the glory, but that will be insults and opposition and plenty of disappointments. Why do you think Jesus told the parable of the sower to his followers? It's only at the last day, at the harvest time, that you will see the fruit of what you've been sowing. What you're going to see along the road of your Christian life and service is a lot of great disappointments and painful things. And that's so true to life, isn't it? Yes, of course, Christian leadership is rewarding even now in many ways. But as Dick Lucas has said, the rewards we have in this life will never be enough to keep us in ministry, certainly not through the hard times because we don't yet see the fruit of our labors, and that is hard. I think that's why so many people I know in ministry have hobbies in things like DIY, because you make something and you see the end product. You build a house and you see what you've done. That's why Edward has his chickens to play with. They lay eggs and he hatches them and he grows them up and they win prizes. (laughs) He gets his reward now. But the real prize... The real crown of our life's work is not yet revealed. And so instead, as John Calvin says, long and great labors are often in vain. Satan sometimes prevails with his wicked devices. So then, to prevent the faithful servant of Christ from being cast down, there is this one and only remedy to turn his eyes to the coming of Christ. By this it will come about that he who seems to derive no encouragement from men will faithfully go on with his labor, knowing that a great reward is prepared for him by the Lord. So friends, let every one of us who's been given a charge of shepherding precious people of Christ, old or young, large or small, public or private, let us be faithful to our calling and to Christ's character in it, whatever the cost, as we are shaped through our shepherding of others for glory. Because that's the only road to glory for every true Christian leader. And when the chief shepherd appears, says Peter, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you.
that you call us to serve as under-shepherds of the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus himself. Help us to be a people doing Jesus' work, Jesus' way, for Jesus' glory alone. And we ask it for his sake and in his name. Amen. We're going to close by singing hymn number 940. Another great hymn by Charles Wesley, speaking of our daily labor, our calling, our tasks, and our following the Lord Jesus Christ. You would I set at my right hand, whose eyes my inmost secrets view, and labor on at your command, and offer all my work to you. Number 940. And so grant, Lord Jesus Christ, that we may walk closely with you that road to heaven, rejoicing in the cost, exhibiting your character, gladly serving our charge, and looking and longing for the unfading crown. And to that end, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.